Summary of Interesting Facts About Space, a novel written by Emily Austin. Chapter 1. The rhythmic beeping of the grocery store scanner blended with the unsettling narration of the true crime podcast. The cashier, unknowingly caught in a discordant symphony, asked the standard question, How are you today? while the podcast host eerily revealed the discovery of a girl's body in an old lady's basement. With headphones firmly in place, the narrator, immersed in their favorite true crime podcast, read the cashier's lips and responded with a polite, I'm good, thanks, how are you? The podcast's grim narrative continued, detailing the grotesque scenario of a teenager's decomposing body found among fruit preserves and pickled beets in a grandmother's cellar. The mundane act of placing a divider between groceries became a symbolic gesture, a makeshift barrier against accidental purchases of Vienna sausages or the potential loss of tampons to the man behind. The podcast's dark humor interwove with the everyday scenario, as the cashier scanned boxed cake mix and might all. Do you need bags? The cashier asked, breaking the macabre narrative for a moment. No, thank you, I brought my own, the narrator gestured to their tote bag. The podcast host injected a grotesque joke about pickling murdered teenagers, highlighting the unsettling coping mechanism intertwined with true crime fascination. As the groceries moved along the conveyor belt, the podcast and reality danced together, a strange juxtaposition of darkness and routine. The outside world collided abruptly when an angry man rammed into the narrator's shoulder, scattering belongings across the floor. The impact sent a phone, keys, credit card, and the contents of the wallet flying. The man stormed away without a glance back, leaving chaos in his wake. A good Samaritan knelt to help retrieve the scattered items. Thank you, the narrator expressed gratitude, still processing the unexpected encounter. He must have anger management issues, the good Samaritan remarked, standing up. The narrator nodded in agreement, he probably has a parasite. Excuse me, a man rams into my shoulder. The unexpected impact propels my belongings from my hands. My phone, keys, credit card, and the entrails of my wallet sail before me. The angry man storms onward. He does not pause to look back. A good Samaritan kneels to help recover my belongings. Thank you, I say. No problem. Why did that man shove you? I'm not sure. She stands up. He must have anger management issues. I nod. He probably has a parasite. What? Nothing. Thank you again. The peculiar mention of a parasite serves as a reminder of the narrator's unique perspective, born deaf in one ear. It becomes a shield against irksome sounds, but also a source of obliviousness to social cues. The narrative weaves between past and present, offering glimpses into the narrator's life from childhood struggles with speech to adult encounters shaped by a singular perspective. The journey continues outside the grocery store, where the podcast resumes its morbid tales, intertwining with the narrator's daily life. The revelation of a gruesome crime scene is interrupted by the cashier's inquiry about space news. Flashes on the sun and the potential impact of solar flares on Earth momentarily shift the narrative's focus. The contents of the teenager's stomach revealed that she had eaten peaches two hours before her death. Her autopsy also showed that she, there is a pause for emphasis, was two months pregnant. Sharp pain radiates from my lower back. I fish into my tote bag for the mydol I just bought. While searching, the automatic door behind me opens. A blast of air conditioning cools my back. I glance at the customer exiting. It's a man carrying a 40-pack of toilet paper above his head like it's a trophy. He has sweat stains in his armpits and the noticeable outline of a condom in his pocket. I discreetly swallow a dry pill while I listen to the podcast host say, it was soon discovered that the girl was dating an older man named Jerry Nitt. Jerry, a bald man in his early 40s. I rip my headphones out and immediately Google Space News. Flashes on the sun could help us predict solar flares. Solar flares can impact Earth, they can disrupt radio communications and create electrical blackouts. The sudden shift from true crime to space news reflects the narrator's attempt to escape the darkness of the podcast. It adds a layer of complexity to their character, 
revealing an interest in science and a coping mechanism to counterbalance the grim narratives. Am I speaking to Enid? A woman in my phone asks. I can't tell if it's scorching out, if I'm having period-induced hot flashes, or if I've taken a wrong turn and accidentally descended into hell. My back aches. I'm lugging home groceries. My shirt is pasted to my wet body, like papier-mâché. I skipped the previous episode of my podcast and am now listening to the next. This new episode is about a cannibal. The host was just detailing how the man seasoned his human flesh, thyme and rosemary, when the story was interrupted by my phone ringing. Yes? I struggle to hold my phone up to my good ear. My tote bag presses into my shoulder. Sweat stings my eyes. Are you fucking Joan? The woman's voice cracks. I stop walking. A cyclist in full-body purple spandex swerves around me. He rings his bell as he pedals furiously ahead. Are you dating Joan? I ask. I had no idea Joan had a girlfriend. No, she says. I'm not sure, I say. Let me check. I open my phone. I scroll up in my text conversations with Joan to unearth when we started talking. Polly and I stand quietly while I scroll. I finally reach the top of our texts and announce, one month. I look into her face to see if that is good news or bad news. A month is quite short, I think. It's not like it has been going on for years. A month is nothing, really. It's a blip, she puts her face in her hands. Her shoulders quake. Maybe it was her birthday this month. Maybe it was their wedding anniversary. Are you sure I can't get you some water? I ask. She doesn't reply. She cries silently into her palms. I feel terrible about this, I say, my throat tightening. I feel something twitch in my stomach. It's not your fault, she says, uncovering her face. We've been unhappy for a while. Tracks of mascara are sledding down her cheeks. We've had a difficult year. Joan's dad died four months ago. There's a crack in the foundation of our house that we can't afford to fix. I think I might have MS. I don't know what to say. She exhales loudly, then looks me dead in the eyes. I do not look away. She and I stare into each other's pupils for longer than is comfortable. Her irises are the same color as Mars, rusty brown and bloodshot. Her eyelashes are clumped with wet mascara. This moment feels very intimate. Neither of us are speaking. I look at her mascara tracks and think of the slope streaks that form on Mars when it is warm, and there are landslides. We have blinked more than once and are now officially staring each other down. I feel like the amount of time we've been looking into each other's eyes now exceeds an amount of time that is appropriate when you are standing in front of a stranger in a grocery store. Polly's words hang in the air, heavy with the weight of a crumbling relationship and unforeseen challenges. The revelation of Joan's recent struggles adds a layer of empathy, blurring the lines between infidelity and the complexity of human emotions. The narrator, caught in the midst of an unintended love triangle, grapples with the aftermath of a betrayal they never anticipated. Chapter 2 I wake up to the blaring sound of my alarm, my room bathed in the soft glow of morning light. Disoriented, I sit up and rub my eyes, trying to shake off the remnants of a strange dream. In the dream, I was searching for something, someone, in the shadows of my apartment. A feeling of paranoia lingers as I glance around, half expecting an intruder to materialize. Driven by a sudden surge of adrenaline, I jump out of bed and approach the curtains. I clench my fists, preparing for a confrontation with an unseen figure, standing flush against the wall. I throw a punch at the fabric, ready to defend myself, but there's nothing there. Just empty air and the morning sunlight streaming through the window. I slam the window shut, my heart still pounding. As I turn away, a corner of my towel snags on the window sill. Irritated, I yank it free, my mind still on edge. I decide to check beneath the bed, half expecting to find an intruder hiding in the shadows. On my knees, I peer into the darkness under the bed, mentally preparing for a face to stare back at me. Instead, all I find are mundane items, a half-empty Gatorade bottle, a graphic t-shirt I thought I had lost, dusty clumps of hair, 
and a condom. What the hell? I mutter to myself, reaching for the condom. Never mind. It's just a discarded sucker, and I didn't see the stick. My mind, still clouded with paranoia, plays tricks on me. Polly, a friend who happened to be at my apartment, joins in the search. Do you really think someone came in here? She asks, concern etched on her face. Maybe not, but why take the chance? I reply, tearing the wrapper off the old sucker and putting it in my mouth. Lemon flavor. Polly, now exploring my closet, questions me about the hand-knit sweaters. No, my mom does, I respond, scanning the apartment for any sign of an intruder hiding behind furniture or curtains. As we stand in silence, I make a shushing gesture, cupping my hand around my ear, listening intently for any rustling or breathing. Nothing but the hum of the refrigerator fills the air. After what feels like an eternity, Polly whispers, I should go. Outside, on the sidewalk, we exchange goodbyes. Polly hugs me, but my mind is elsewhere. I realize too late that my arms have been hanging limp at my sides throughout the embrace. She locks eyes with me and expresses gratitude, a sincerity that almost makes me flinch. As she drives away, I sit on the concrete step, putting my headphones in to drown out the world. The murder podcast begins to play, calming my nerves. The details of gruesome crimes are oddly reassuring, a reminder that, despite the chaos in my own life, there's order in the predictability of crime stories. Later, alone in my apartment, I send a text to Joan, ending a budding relationship. It's a sudden decision, but I need space. Her response is a curt K. I put both headphones in, a shield against unwanted conversations, and play the next episode of the podcast. The familiar voice recounts the chilling tale of Ted Bundy. Though I know the story well, repetition offers a sense of control, a familiarity in the face of life's uncertainties. The day progresses, filled with moments of introspection and mundane tasks. I find solace in the routine, baking a cake, talking to my mom about space, and delving into the past through old YouTube videos. My teenage self, awkward and vulnerable, speaks through the screen. The videos serve as a haunting reminder of past bullying, a chapter I'd rather forget. I can't remember being that age, and the videos, a strange history of my life, feel almost unreal. As night falls, I sit alone, icing the cake and listening to the podcast. The host delves into Bundy's tactics, describing his deceptive charm. The conversation turns to the perception of attractiveness and criminality. I ponder these notions while watching cream swirl in my coffee, forming shapes reminiscent of galaxies. In the quiet of the night, as I drift into uneasy sleep, I dream of a green room with a telephone, a red balloon, and the lingering presence of Ted Bundy. The podcast continues to play, a lullaby of murder that paradoxically soothes my restless mind.